been a, an interesting uh, topic and I'm sure something that uh, you all have uh, heard about. So a uh, little bit about my background. So as Katie mentioned, uh, all three degrees at UMKC was in uh, mechanical engineering and um, somehow ended up doing fire protection engineering, which then led me to healthcare, which then led me to doing uh, all of the uh, fun healthcare stuff to do today. Um, sp spent a lot of time on campus and, uh, you know, it's been awesome to see UMKC grow and, you know, continue to add new buildings and, um, you know, new programs and uh, really looking forward to the uh, new engineering building that's uh, coming up. So with that, uh, here's what we're going to kind of talk about today a little bit on COVID-19, um, a little bit about transmission paths um, and kind of what we're considering from an engineering standpoint on building systems. Um, talk about kind of what we've done for some of the hospitals we work with. Um, and then chat about some of the things that you probably have seen in the news through the uh, United States Corps of Engineers kind of implement, implemented a program to look at temporary facilities as an option, um, converting hotels, dorms over, um, and then convention center kind of venues being converted over to uh, patient care sites. And then we'll kind of take a glimpse into the post COVID-19 world, which is, you know, kind of one of the items we're looking at now and what does that mean for us on the building systems end? And so just if, I'm, I'm, hopefully everybody's seen this by now, but you know, this was a novel coronavirus. So it's, it was a new coronavirus that had not been previously identified. And then, you know, the, the virus itself is actually SARS-CoV-2 um, and that's what causes COVID-19, which is actually the disease. So um, I, I always think that's uh, an interesting fact and, you know, uh, WHO and CDC both have a lot of great information on this and we've spent a lot of time there looking at, you know, trying to make sure that from a building systems design standpoint that we're doing what's right. So this um, is a topic that Henderson actually presented on last week and it, it kind of talks about the different um, transmission paths that uh, we, we look at from a building system standpoint. So you've got surface transmission, droplet transmission, and then airborne or aerosol transmission. And you can see in here, there's just quite a bit of um, thought and design that, that goes into, you know, ways that we can impact um, this through building systems. And really, as an engineer, um, we're kind of focusing on these three transmission paths here. You can see surface transmission, uh, clearly when a person touches a contaminated surface and then spreads it you know, to their face, their eyes, and introducing the virus. Uh, droplet transmission, um, you know, talking about uh, persons just generally talking, coughing, sneezing within close contact of others. Um, and these are gonna be the large droplets that are gonna be uh, making direct contact. And then airborne or aerosol transmission, um, you know, similarly coughing, talking, sneezing, but these would be more on the smaller uh, droplet end. And these are suspended in air for longer and will transmit over a greater distance. So these were kind of the three tracks that we were looking at um, in terms of what can we do on the building systems and, you know, in, in these different settings and for these different kind of um, options. So first one we'll talk about is um, the one that we probably did the most work in, um, in just what we would do within a hospital. And so it's, it's been kind of an interesting um, change. So typically in our, our, our normal focus in hospitals is preventing germs, bacteria, viruses from reaching patients. So, you know, you, you or a family member or loved one goes to the hospital because they've got you know, they're sick or they had a broken bone or something like that, um, you know, uh, cancer treatments or, or different things. And so our whole goal there is to actually, you know, provide positively pressurized air so that we're trying to keep the area and air as clean and, and um, sterile as possible. And um, I guess another way to think about that too is we, you know, an operating room is probably the most sterile, sterile part of the building. And so that's going to be super highly positively pressurized with 
lots of air. So a lot of air changes an hour. Um, and, and basically from there moving out, it gets a little, I don't, I don't, the, the term dirtier is not right, but it, it's just not as clean. Um, and so sterile storage would kind of be your next area out and your near corridors surrounding your operating rooms. So they're still pretty clean. Um, and then even the patient rooms themselves. So, you know, in a normal setting, we're, we're positively pressurizing just about a lot of spaces in the hospital to, to prevent contamination um, from staff to patient, from visitors to patients, from just normal folks working in the hospital. In the airborne infectious diseases realm, which is, you know, kind of what we've been dealing with mostly here with the coronaviruses, but also in the past with tuberculosis or Ebola, we're kind of doing the opposite because we've got um, the patient is actually very contagious and, and can spread, you know, the uh, through the three transmission paths that we just mentioned. So now we're, instead of looking at trying to prevent germs from getting into the patient room where this patient would be, we're now preventing these uh, the spread of these transmission um, from the room to staff or to visitors or out. So the way to do that typically is with negative pressure and typically we will um, we will have a handful of those rooms kind of spread throughout the uh, the hospital but um, it's it's just been a it's been a completely different kind of thought process and um, I will say when about the Ebola outbreak happened in 2014 it was pretty common that we had a lot of hospitals look at you know, adding airborne infectious disease rooms, negative isolation rooms, um, what would you do there? And, you know, similarly, when some of the other um, SARS and MERS were kind of um, spreading around and there was talk, um, a lot of hospitals and health systems looked at doing something. And then when they went away quickly, um, you know, some of the planes were scrapped or we moved on to the next thing or went back to normal. So, I would say in general, um, most hospitals, uh, especially the larger hospitals, are going to have at least a handful of negative isolation rooms just to deal with st standard things that come in, you know, tuberculosis or, you know, we're, is, we're not as um, always um, in the pandemic or outbreak mode um, with infectious diseases. Um, you know, it could also be to tr 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 treat or uh, hold um, kind of some of the worst case flus that have gone around, you know, this, this last flu season, we had flu A and flu B that were running rampant um, in uh, late winter. They were around the time when coronavirus and COVID-19 kind of started spreading. So with, within the hospital, we've got um, these negative isolation rooms. And um, what, what is specific about these rooms is they are isolated um, and they've got a, an isolated exhaust that goes directly to the, the outside of the building. So even if the um, patient room itself is on the fifth floor, we're going to take it, you know, to the outside or to the roof on the 10th floor, if that's where it exists. And typically, um, we're still concerned about virus spread at that point. So we'll run a HEPA filter, which is going to catch the, the bulk of the particles leaving the building so that we're not preventing that spread um, outside the building and then you know we we also have to be concerned with where those exhaust fans are located um, is there you know makeup air or something like that located close or windows that could be open so we typically try to uh, put a HEPA filter on those um, as well anyway um, another thing that's pretty common with these rooms you will have an ante room between the corridor and the actual patient room itself and that serves to give staff a little bit of extra space to put on additional uh, personal protective equipment or have a space where they can, you know, wash their hands, gown up, gown down. Um, and it's really just kind of a buffer between the uh, corridor. And again, that will have its own um, exhaust similar to the uh, negative isolation patient room. Um, typically, you know, in the, in the, if in the short term, um, you know, you could use something as simple as a ball in a wall that would tell you whether the, the room is uh, negatively pressure pressurized or not. But most hospitals have some sort of continuous monitor that's regulating, um, you know, the pressure in the ante room as well as the uh, actual patient room itself. And because it is a negative pressure, um, 
we are trying to help prevent the spread of virus outside of that room. And in order to classify as a negative airborne isolation room, we have to get 12 air changes an hour, which is quite a bit in it, uh, quite a bit. And so that these, these rooms, like I said, there's a handful of these rooms that exist in most hospitals. Um, you know, typically if you look at each kind of department, there's usually one or two per department. And um, so we, we did have a handful of these ready to, to be used um, when COVID-19 hit. Um, so the, one of the first things that was kind of done within actual hospitals was to kind of look at, hey, is there any way to take an existing standard patient room that's, you know, a little bit quasi positively pressurized um, and change it into a temporary negative isolation room. And there's definitely ways to do that. And we helped a handful of health systems across the US kind of look at these different types of options. Um, one of them is as simple as there's a portable exhaust machine um, that you can just locate in a patient room. You plug it into 120, and then you've got to find a way to exhaust it to the outside. Oftentimes, especially in some of the older hospitals that were built in the 60s and 70s, they still had operable windows. So we were able to um, modify that and to run the exhaust directly to the outside. Um, another option that we looked at, but we're not highly in favor of, is just recirculating the exhaust or return air into uh, an air handling unit. And you, you can do that. Um, there are some, some challenges with that, one of which is you need to put a HEPA filter on that uh, return duct um, in the room with a MERS-17 um, filter. And um, the, some of the issues with that, you're going to need space to install that filter in the ductwork. And a lot of the older, um, older facilities just don't have the space above the ceiling to do that. Um, another challenge is you put the filter in there and then you've got an additional pressure drop in the return duct. So you may have to install a booster fan to help uh, boost uh, the pressure. And then uh, because we're adding, you know, in, in order to qualify for that, and we've got 12 air changes an hour, uh, we need to update the, uh, the test and balance um, in the room and actually check the supplier to make sure that we're, um, you know, in, in, making sure that uh, we're not causing issues with um, pulling air out of the corridor or too much air from other places. And then it's just, it's sometimes it's difficult in the older facilities, we just don't have the makeup air or the uh, return air to be able to get the 12 air changes an hour. So sometimes it might be a case of getting as close as we can. So that was uh, definitely one of the options we looked at um, pretty quickly was uh, trying to just convert over a handful of negative isolation rooms. Um, some other con considerations that kind of have tied into COVID-19, um, and I'm sure you've seen this, but the Corps of Engineers looked at bringing, there was a handful of hospitals in certain areas, Chicago, Detroit, um, New Orleans, where they had a hospital that was closed and then and decommissioned, and so they brought those back online. Um, we looked a lot at not only converting some of the patient rooms over to negative isolation rooms, but also, you know, would you consider turning over an entire unit or a wing to treat, you know, COVID-19 patients or non-COVID-19 patients, just so you're keeping, keeping some of the uh, modalities together and just trying to prevent cross-contamination as much as possible. Um, some other things that you probably saw or heard, telehealth um, all of a sudden went from not being used a lot um, because it wasn't reimbursed by Medicaid and Medicare to being used, um, you know, quite a bit. And so just trying to keep pe people that didn't need to go to the hospital from having to go to the hospital, just to, again, prevent cross-contamination with folks. Some other things we looked at, um, testing facilities. So just about every hospital um, looked at some form of having an area where they could test. Um, we even had a facility that converted an ambulance garage from a, or from an ambulance garage to a uh, tent um, to do some testing. And then the other thing that was um, kind of heavily used was anything that had shell space um, or kind of unused space. Um, we looked at creating these areas that were called kind of an observation ward. And this would be for um, large numbers of patients who had been 
who had been tested um, or displayed symptoms of COVID-19, but not had not been uh, positively confirmed. And so in these kinds of situations, um, it's kind of like the, the, the picture you would have seen of the, of the main conversion in New York that made all the news or the picture that was uh, shown earlier here on this slide presentation. But these were not necessarily patient beds, um, but more like a cot in an area where these folks could kind of be treated and, and, and observed by staff. Um, typically in this kind of setup, we did try to, we did, we weren't necessarily able to get 12 air changes an hour, but we were able to make it negative so that we were preventing, trying to help prevent spread of the virus um, outside of the space. So that was kind of what we did at main hospitals. Um, the, the kind of the first next thing that was uh, looked at was this kind of discussion on temporary conversions and modular spaces. So um, again, one of the things that you saw in Wuhan pretty immediately, they built a very large temporary modular hospital facility in, in, a, in about seven days time, which is pretty incredible. Uh, in India, they looked at actually converting over um, space and train carriages to treat COVID-19 patients. Um, and then just, just north of UMKC, the Midwest Research Institute actually had created a pod um, for, I think originally it was used maybe for Ebola evaluations and they converted it over for COVID-19 evaluations. So you think a lot of these uh, temporary modular spaces are able to be shipped out pretty quickly and um, set up pretty quickly. So we had a handful of healthcare facilities and then the Corps of Engineers also looked at this concept of using modular trailers. Um, we've, we've done this pretty regularly when we've renovated hospitals and we need to shut down an apartment, an emergency department or an OR um, while they're doing renovations. So you park your modular trailer there on site near the hospital. Um, you know, typically they would either be designed for COVID-19 patients or for non-COVID-19 patients, again, to prevent cross-contamination. Um, and then they're, they're assembled pretty quickly. And um, we're typically looking, if it was being used for COVID-19 patients, it was probably more um, for being used for an open observation ward. And one of the things that's kind of nice about that is that they are close um, to a hospital, so they have plenty of operational support. You've got facilities folks that can help with if there's an issue with the air handling system, um, if there's emergency power issues or technology problems. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the company Pods actually has um, come up with a couple different concepts to ship their uh, Pods containers out that they can use to house or treat patients. And, oops, and next slide. So this is kind of a, uh, our concept of if you had a mobile trailer that was designed to house um, infectious disease patients and, um, and, and it was just kind of a big open ward. Um, this is one of the ways we were looking at the HVAC system to potentially help prevent cross-contamination even within staff. So you're, you're gonna be using 100% outside air um, to come inside from the air handler and then most of these wards would be set up kind of with a main common corridor and then you'd have kind of the patient beds or patient treatment areas kind of against the exterior walls. And what that helps to do is we're able to have a common kind of supply air in the um, corridor area. So we're kind of creating a little positive pressure zone and then we're exhausting near the patient's bed um, or cot. And Again, that means that we're taking those germs and basically pulling them right, right, right past the patient. So again, keeping staff that's walking in here quasi, um, you know, we're trying to limit their exposure as we um, allow them to help treat through the patients. So that was kind of one of the concepts we had uh, looked at for the modular spaces. So the next step was probably um, another one that you heard quite a bit about, just the concept of converting a hotel or a dorm over. And there's definitely some opportunities and challenges there. Um, you look at how a hotel or a dorm is uh, designed. They've got individual rooms. Um, typically in a hotel, you've got a private bathroom. So it's set up very similar to what a patient room would look like in a hospital. 
which is nice. Um, additionally, um, you've got a lot of uh, infrastructure that um, you would you would need um, to kind of help support these kind of um, situations um, as as we would go into this temporary kind of conversion. So um, there there are some areas that would need renovations. Um, you would need probably a station, an area for nurses or doctors or staff to kind of gather. Um, you look at medication rooms um, and then as well as soiled and clean storage for um, supplies. And then, you know, another consideration is again, these hotels are often you will find hotels close to hospitals. So again, from an operational standpoint, um, you've got all the needed staff and um, support that you need. And so on the, the hotel end, probably the largest challenge that we kind of saw, well, two big large challenges, but uh, on the mechanical end, again, we're trying to, if this hotel was being used for COVID-19 patients, um, we are trying to create some of those negative isolation rooms. And within the room itself, there's gonna have to be some changes made. Um, we would look at, you know, most of those uh, hotel rooms probably have carpet and a lot of soft surfaces that can't be cleaned. So you have to clean those out, um, you know, place it with a vinyl floor or something like that quickly. And then, you know, mechanically, you've probably got some sort of little PTAC unit that's going to, you know, keep it just cool enough or maybe just hot enough to, uh, for, for folks to stay inside there. And so we're probably going to be very limited on how we're going to be able to deal with supply air and exhaust. Um, one of the things we did look at, there is an exhaust fan in the restroom, um, clearly not sized large enough to be able to create a fully negative uh, pressure room um, for the whole entire hotel room. But um, there, there's definitely ways to do it. Um, we could have created a separate exhaust system um, and you know, we could have resized the existing exhaust fan for the restrooms um, and made some minor changes to the ductwork within there. Um, those are definitely things we had to consider. Um, and then probably the most critical is that because we are treating patients and, you know, a lot of the COVID-19 patients that have, that have gotten some of the worst cases have required to be on ventilators, um, which is going to require emergency power. And it is very rare to find a hotel with emergency power. So we would, we were definitely uh, going to have to add an emergency generator, one run life safety power up, up to every room. And so they had it in there anyway, but then any of the ones that would have required a ventilator, um, just very critical. And so tied to the ventilator, basically all those patients are getting oxygen. Um, it probably is not going to be feasible to install a piped medical gas system like we would have normally in a hospital where you've got oxygen and vacuum and air all at a patient's bed normally. So they'd, they'd be running through uh, bottled oxygen, um, probably in cylinders. And so there's definitely concerns with that. Um, the medical gas in terms of being stored, we have to create a separate room which has its own ventilation requirements um, for exhaust and supply. And then one other thing that was kind of critical to the whole this, uh, all this was that these patients again, aren't going anywhere. So it was very important that these buildings were safe and they were sprinklered with a fire sprinkler system. Um, they had a fire alarm system with smoke detectors for, for early detection and uh, things like that. And actually one other point on the hotel conventions, I think a lot of people, when we first saw this come out, this program kind of come out from the Corps of Engineers, would have figured that hotels would have been the most common, but they, uh, in fact, I think maybe only a handful of hotels actually got converted over. Um, and then some of our teams that actually looked at with some architects in some jurisdictions and hospitals, um, converting schools over um, and some other places like that. Um, probably the most common will be this discussion on the convention center and venue conversion. Um, you know, some of the opportunities here were these facilities are very large. Um, they're already designed to be flexible. You know, you think about going to a conference center and you've got, you know, the ballrooms and the meeting rooms that can be shifted and changed pretty quickly. Um, and honestly, they were with 
a few minor tweaks to the mechanical system were kind of already set up to treat a large number of similar patients. Um, so again, you're not going to mix modalities here if they're all COVID-19 patients or non-COVID-19 patients. Um, that's going to be the best bet just because of the way the mechanical system's laid out. Um, but these, these projects can also be done very quickly. You can see in the picture here, you know, what you're talking about is a cot, you know, some temporary partitions, a curtain, a couple of chairs. Um, in some of the more uh, detailed um, areas, you know, you would have potentially had some duct work, you would have had some temporary power connections. Um, you know, maybe they would have done some piped gases potentially in some some of the more heavily used areas where they had a lot of ventilators going but these projects were definitely done quickly i would say most of these corps of engineer projects where they converted convention centers were done in in anywhere from you know one week to two to three weeks tops uh, most of them were converted very quickly with uh, most of the design teams and construction teams working on these working three three shifts so there was pretty much 24 hours a day support trying to make sure these things were converted as fast as possible. Um, another positive is that they are often located near hospital facilities. So again, from an operational standpoint, you've got support staff coming from there. Um, you've got supplies coming from there. Um, you know, convention centers themselves will often have some sort of kitchen or concessions area that can be used for meal preparation. So less concern from bringing that over from the hospital. Um, typically they have a very robust technology system for Wi-Fi. So running communications um, through the existing system was uh, pretty common. And then there's a lot of breakout spaces for when they allowed either uh, family to come on site or for staff. Um, you've already got other meeting rooms that can be used for, you know, folks that are working with COVID patients or non-COVID patients or staff that's working on um, entry points or you know security and things like that and then typically they will have a very generous loading dock space so supplies and temporary infrastructure so that most of these convention centers will have a do have emergency power on them but say for example we did have to make some uh you know bring in a temporary generator or add a temporary air handler to help support um you know the negative air or the makeup air Load, typically the loading dock, there was space there to uh, handle that if needed. And then this is kind of one of the concepts we looked at um, from uh, the, the this is mechanical side um, from if you were treating COVID-19 patients. So most of the existing venue HVAC systems are probably not going to have HEPA filters or, um, you know, UV or something like that to help kill or treat viruses within the air handlers themselves. So um, we would have to do something there. Um, one other discussion would be, you know, you may have to make some modifications to the duct work. Um, you know, we may also create our own exhaust um, near the patient pods and then actually run that exhaust up and out so that again, we're trying to prevent cross-contamination. You know, you're exhausting near the patient's bed so that we're not preventing staff. And then, you know, again, if you're treating this kind of common supply, it's no different than the temporary setup where we've got hopefully a quasi-positively pressurized corridor where staff are moving and then kind of creating that negative uh, pressure area just where the patients are. Um, one thing that we would have to look at and did look at for sure was um, just the concept of a lot of the HVAC zones were already set up to kind of help support certain uh, meeting or ballroom um, concepts. So we'd have to look at, you know, where those were and then adjust accordingly or set up kind of the patients uh, based on that. Um, talked about the emergency power already being in there. Um, and then a lot of times uh, these facilities are already set up with temporary connections for either HVAC or emergency power, to be honest with you. And then we talked a little bit about medical gas already. Uh, most of these places were using uh, bottled medical gas just, just in the, the need of um, time. And again, uh, I don't think a lot of these spaces that were converted over, they may have been treating COVID-19 patients, but they were not probably treating the worst. We were probably sending the patients with the worst symptoms to the hospitals so that they were actually, um, the ventilators are more readily, um, 
you know, supported in a hospital setting for sure. So now that we've kind of, uh, you know, we've, we had all these different kind of options um, and, and we're definitely things that were considered and done. And now one of the things that we're kind of looking at now in, especially in healthcare facilities is what does this post COVID-19 world look at? And a lot of it goes back to just what can we do with building systems and how can we help prevent those three transmission paths in, in any way we can. So, um, and there's, there's two different kind of thoughts here. You know, we're looking at the short term, what can we do that's pretty quickly or, or cheaper that would allow the facility to be prepared for this if there is a second wave in the fall or in, you know, in the winter, um, you know, how do we prepare for this again? And then a longer term option um, for facilities that are either in master planning or looking at building a new healthcare facility. Um, so some of the things we've looked at is, um, you know, telehealth, just keeping patients out of the hospital unless they actually need to be there. Um, you know, right now there's a lot of focus on socially distancing folks within facilities. I mean, we're looking at um, technology there where you would have an app where if you did have to go to the emergency department at a hospital, you know, you would register online with all your information. They would tell you potentially even where to park and then they would have an app going, telling you basically to, to wait in your car until, um, until it was time for you to be seen. And that way they could kind of help prevent large numbers of folks uh, congregating in a waiting space. Um, some other things we've been looking at um, would be even in an emergency department waiting room would be kind of going back to the concept of what you would see if you've been in a pediatric office. Typically in a pediatric office, you've got a, a sick waiting room and a healthy waiting room and maybe applying a similar concept to that to an emergency department. So in the future, if you go there because you have a broken bone, they would assign you to sit in a certain area or a certain seat uh, versus if you came in with some sort of infectious disease symptoms um, or even just like the flu, um, they would put you in another area that may be exhausted a little heavier or may have low exhaust kind of by the seating area just to prevent cross-contamination. So those are definitely things we're looking at there and technology is going to be a, a, a big place. Um, another concept that's being talked about quite a bit is UV light. So we regularly use UV in a lot of our air handlers and the ORs just to kill anything that might be in the air. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, not only in healthcare, but in you know, office settings or in sports venues or um, just about everywhere. You know, how could we use UV? Could we put it in air handlers? Is there a way to use um, something just outside of the UV spectrum that's harmful to to humans. Um, we do that a lot also in hospitals. A lot of the operating rooms will use what's called indigo light, which is just out of the range of harmful to humans, um, but it is effective in killing um, certain bacteria, germs, and some viruses on surfaces when it has enough time to do it. And really that's the, the, the biggest kicker, I think, is that you know, there's a lot of folks selling UV light right now, but everybody's application for the UV light is going to be different depending on what they're trying to accomplish. So I've had a lot of conversations about that. Um, kind of talked about reducing congregating waiting spaces, um, doing smaller sub waiting spaces, um, trying to not have lines, again, using, using apps and other things to um, kind of prevent folks from gathering. And then another concept you think about you know, you go into even just your doctor's office for your annual exam and you may go into one room. Well, you, you may go into a waiting room, then you'll be taken to, you know, an area where maybe they take height and weight, then they move you into an exam room, then maybe you go to a lab to do a blood draw, and then maybe you go to the pharmacy on your way out and you've just visited six or seven locations, you know, potentially in a clinic, potentially in a hospital. And so is there ways we can design exam rooms to do everything and and maybe the caregiver is the one that's changing out maybe you have you've registered online and then you have somebody come in to draw blood somebody come in to do your exam somebody that brings your prescriptions in um, so preventing you from from basically walking through the facility and again just 
trying to prevent you know either lines or just transmission spread of uh, droplets. Um, and then one other thing that we've had healthcare facilities kind of looking at would be basically this concept of flushing air. And um, in an in an operating room, this is this is huge. And even in you know an airborne infectious disease room, so negative isolation room. Let's say it's housing a COVID nineteen patient. Um, you know, basically they um, will have to, once that patient gets discharged from the room, the room needs to be fully flush with supplies or with the air supply before they can um, even send someone in to go clean it. And so that will vary completely based on how long um, it takes to flush the room, which is gonna be contingent on um, how long uh, or how, how much air can can be pushed through there so um, one of the things we've looked at is just this concept of oversizing an air handler to basically flush the, the space faster so that they can do more procedures can treat more patients um, all those kinds of things but again that costs money and all these things are you know things that uh, healthcare facilities are probably going to be looking at in the short term and then kind of we'll uh, switch over to the uh, more longer term. So some of the other things that we could look at from a longer term uh, discussion would be designing some of these spaces to be more flexible for um, where they could be normally used as potentially like an intensive care unit room. Uh, but in, in an area of when we have an outbreak or a pandemic, they could be flipped over to negative isolation. Um, we've already had these discussions with a handful of the healthcare facilities right now. Um, and um, it, this is a bigger, longer term plan, um, but you could even retrofit some of the existing ICUs to potentially um, be, be converted for use. Um, this, this has been a, a concept that's been definitely hot in, in healthcare. And even, even so as you would have like maybe a clinic designed by an emergency department to deal with additional surge um, at night and the clinic exam rooms are designed so they could be for emergency departments or ICUs or negative isolation, things like that. Um, and then there's some other things we could do when we're dealing with a new facility where we could put all of the patient rooms on an, on an air handler and that would allow us to to be more creative with how we deal with the makeup air or, or exhausting um, potentially um, some of those uh, rooms and kind of creating more of a negative air isolation room. Um, and then uh, lastly, another thing that's gonna be probably heavily looked at, and again, you know, we don't, we don't know what's to come um, with these in airborne infectious diseases or how prevalent or common they're gonna be, but Definitely another option would be from a medical gas system standpoint, you know, maybe potentially oversizing the oxygen line so that there, there is maybe you have a unit or you have a department inside the, the hospital that could handle um, a surge amount of ventilators that, you know, normally wouldn't, wouldn't happen. And then just for everybody's use, you know, we thought this was kind of interesting. We've, we've, Henderson as a whole has been looking at this and, We've had a lot of discussions on how do you design for infection control, you know, converting these structures over, um, you know, what's happening to power and then just technologies for infection control. So I want to at least provide this out there for anyone that's interested in kind of reading about um, ways that we're from a building system design standpoint, trying to help um, treat infection control and knowing that this is going to be, there's going to be an onus put on this moving forward, I think, um, in, in every sector, not just healthcare, but, you know, you think about going to a hotel now, well, are you going to feel safe, you know, and, and secure knowing that the facility has done everything it can to help keep you safe and help limit the spread of germs and viruses and um, all those things that comes with it. So with that, I think, um, Katie, we are ready if we've got any questions that have popped up or anything else anyone wants to chat about. There are no questions in the chat right now. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Absolutely. And we can get this to uh, Katie and share this out if anyone else is interested. And, uh, you know, or even if you want to talk about experiences of going through three degrees in a very long time period. 
I feel like I've been in school longer than I've not been in school, but it's all been for good. Always en enjoyed learning and uh, that's been one of my passions and actually my uh, the Gallup Strength Finder, that's been my number one uh, thing is learning, so. That's easy. Yeah. <laughs> if you have questions after and you want to email me, um, you should all have my email address. Um, but I will be sending out a follow up email after the event. Um, so feel free to send those and I can get those to Mark um, if you do have questions. Yeah, or absolutely. Or if you just want to chat about healthcare and or any of these things, I mean, it's all, it's all fun stuff. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mark. We appreciate your time and this was really interesting. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in and uh, hopefully we'll connect with you all soon, maybe in person again one day. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.